everyone. Uh, Erica Borgren here, and I'm hoping somebody can confirm you're hearing me before I launch us in this morning. Sounds great. Perfect. Thank you. Well, good morning, and, and welcome to what, what's going to be a good discussion here this morning. Um, I'm Erica Borgren, and I have the pleasure of serving as the chair of Illinois Joining Forces, the organization hosting uh, today's event. Um, I'm joined by two awesome fellow veterans uh, for a panel here today, and they'll introduce themselves shortly. And we're really thrilled to be having a conversation with each other and with all of you who have joined us um, regarding service members, veterans, and their families, their evolving needs and experiences, and some of the evolving resources that are out there to support as well. From the looks of who signed up to join us, uh, it looks like we have a pretty broad group of folks who have joined, some veterans, some who serve veterans in, in organizations we work with, and others who it looks like have joined just as kind of veteran allies looking to learn more and know how to help veterans in their lives. And it's great to have all of you here. Our hope is that um, through the conversation today, which we'll work to do personally and through stories, our own and those of those uh, veterans that we've served, that you'll walk away with some resource that you didn't know was out there or some piece of understanding about the veteran experience, um, perhaps that you didn't have before. Uh, I thought I would start us off by uh, introducing myself, and that'll naturally lead us in a bit uh, to, to what is Illinois Joining Forces uh, before the fellow um, women of Illinois Joining Forces introduce themselves here this morning. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm the chair of Illinois Joining Forces. Um, I'm also an Army veteran. Um, and the story there is I'm an Illinois native who grew up on pink and ribbons and dance and somehow ended up marching off to West Point at the age of 17 and then into an Army career that followed, um, first as a Medical Service Corps officer, and then in a somewhat unique twist for folks in uniform, ended up serving as a speechwriter uh, and think tank member, really, for General David Petraeus in, in Baghdad and beyond in other places. After returning stateside and serving, uh, leaving the Army, I served at the helm of the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs um, several years ago at this point. And it was there that I gained such an appreciation for the world of support that there is out there, this awesome ecosystem of support for veterans, um, running into all kinds of organizations doing good for those who have served. Um, but also got the sense there, as I was serving at, at the um, IDVA, that it can be a really difficult sea of goodwill to navigate, that there is so much out there that sometimes the trick for veterans and for those looking to help them uh, is, is actually navigating, it's finding the way to the right resource. And it was that observation, which, which others shared as I started to experience and talk about it, that led to, at the time, the creation of a program of the State Department of Veterans Affairs, Illinois Joining Forces. Um, and that, that's the seeds of IJF, which today, we are a publicly chartered, a legislatively chartered public-private nonprofit um, that exists solely to help with that problem set, to help veterans navigate and find the right resource at the right time. Uh, this is what we do. We serve as connective tissue to this awesome world of veteran support. Um, and it gives us a good sense of and helps us serve veterans amidst that ecosystem. So we're eager to share some of our insights today. Um, I'm really thrilled to be serving still with the board of this organization um, and to have with me, as I mentioned, fellow women of IJF. So we have here this morning, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves, um, Illinois State Representative Stephanie Kipowit, um, and also Lene Edwards, both veterans themselves. Um, Stephanie, Representative Kipowit, uh, serves on our board as well. And Lene helps keep the trains running at Illinois Joining Forces. So there are lots of lenses we can bring today's conversation, um, talk with each other, and then answer some of your questions. So why don't I actually turn it over to Representative Kipowit to give a little bit more of a self-introduction. Oh, very good. Thank you, Erica. Um, Erica and I go back, uh, I was in the General Assembly when she was the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs uh, Director, and she did a wonderful job. And in fact, I remember her presenting Illinois Joining Forces in committee. So uh, it, it was definitely her vision to bring um, everybody together for the veteran community so that we can properly share um, resources and just have a, a kind of like a one-stop shop for veterans. So. Um, I apologize, there's a little bit of feedback, but I uh, just want to wish everybody a good morning. Uh, I know it's a little bit rainy where I'm at, but um, it's still uh, Friday, so TGIF for everyone. I am honored and excited to be a part of this amazing panel discussion. So uh, first, I just want to like uh, and thank 
Illinois joining forces for organizing this event. We don't really have a lot of events where women veterans come together and share our stories and actually um, be present in community. Women veterans uh, tend to be a little bit of the, uh, for lack of a better word, forgotten veteran um, that because we just don't have the high and tight or you know fit the haircut or the stamina that most people uh, view veterans as. Um, that is definitely changing with the numbers of veterans that are uh, women and the amount of individuals that are signing up for uh, to serve our country that are women. So it's very exciting. So uh, as Erica said, I am State Representative Stephanie Kipowit. Um, I am the only female veteran out of the 177 members of the Illinois General Assembly. And uh, I'm uh, soon to be the only Marine. There's one Marine uh, male in the Senate that is not running again. So um, we are the few and the proud, <laughs> especially even in the General Assembly. So I served on active duty in the United States Marine Corps from 1990 to 1994. So I actually signed up when I was 17, right out of high school. Um, it was just kind of like a, um, just a, 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 a an initiative that I just felt like I wanted to do. It was something that sounded really exciting. And uh, I was stationed at Camp Pendleton, California, and I was overseas at Camp Butler in Okinawa, Japan. So after returning to Illinois, after being honorably discharged, I was able to attend Illinois, uh, Northern Illinois University on my Illinois Veterans Grant, my GI Bill, and my MAP Grant. And I completed my master's in public administration uh, from NIU as well, so as well as my undergraduates. So um, I've been very blessed. Uh, ironically enough, at Northern Illinois University, I met my husband, and it was kind of funny because um, he had served in the Army for four years prior to coming to NIU. So uh, we're both a, a double military and a, a double NIU family. And uh, on this forum, I will uh, announce that um, my son, uh, is shipping out to boot camp for the Navy uh, July 22nd. So, and my daughter would not join the Air Force. So I wanted a four pack, but it just didn't happen. <laughs> You're still a very purple family, it would seem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we're, we're, we, we have a lot going on. Um, as uh, Erica said, I am um, in the General Assembly. I am the chair of the Illinois House Veterans Affairs Committee, and I'm president of the Northern Illinois chapter of the Women Marine Association. And I am also uh, a current board member of Illinois Joining Forces. Um, and I do support our established veteran organizations. I'm a life member of the Marine Corps League. I'm a member of both AMBETS Post 103 and the Roosevelt Award Post 84. So that's just a little bit about um, myself and a little bit of my background. And I'm just, again, honored and thrilled to be here and um, participating in this great panel discussion. So thank you for having me. Awesome, thank you so much, Representative. Lene, over to you. <laughs> thank you, ladies. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so as Erica mentioned, my name is Lene Edwards and I am a native of Washington State. Um, I served honorably in the Army National Gu Washington Army National Guard uh, for two and a half years. Um, I was also stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington as rear detachment um, for the 792nd Chemical Company. Um, and I was a 92 Alpha Logistics Supply Specialist. Um, I have been out since 2005, so quite some time. I also um, enlisted when I was 17, um, so that seems to be <laughs> the theme, young. Um, I currently, um, I have been in um, Chicago for the last five years. Um, I attended um, Eastern Washington University prior to moving, uh, relocating to Chicago. Um, and graduated from St. Xavier University last spring. Um, once I graduated, I actually came on board with IJF and have been with um, IJF since last June. Um, I currently serve as the business operations analyst. Um, and in this role, I provide um, operational support for all three of our major programs, which is our care coordination center, our VSCs, which is our veteran service communities, and our Women Veterans Program. Um, and also as well, um, I, I provide um, general, general business management for the organization. Um, I would say that I actually feel very privileged to be in the role that I've been in. Um, I, I entered the organization as an intern. So um, 
you know, just getting familiar with the, the mission and the goals of the organization and have transitioned into the role of the business operations analyst. But basically in my role, providing support for each one of the um, programs that we um, provide, I feel like I have a unique outlook on uh, IJF as a whole and our missions, uh, our mission and goals, so. Wonderful. I'm really excited to be here with both of you and how many folks have joined to listen in. Um, I thought maybe I'd start us off on just the topic of transition. Lene, you mentioned transition in the IJF, but it does feel like when it comes to the veteran community, a big piece of that experience is that initial transition out of uniform and back into the civilian world. Um, and, and I guess it, it feels to me that from the time veterans have been coming home, from whatever it was, there has been very... Um, some difficulties in that transition, some common themes across. And I thought actually we'd welcome in a voice, somebody we'd hoped would join us in person today um, and ended up having a conflict, but a, a World War II fellow veteran, a uh, woman herself who, who uh, recorded for us when she couldn't join us, a little bit about her own transition and experience. Um, because as I said, I think that red thread kind of follows all across the veteran experience. And then we'll dive into that topic a little bit as a group. Uh, Representative Kippowit, I know that um, Helen Ellers, who's, whose clip we're about to hear, is a, a friend and a colleague of yours. I'm not sure if you wanted to share a bit more about her before we play uh, that clip. Oh, yeah. Um, Helen, Helen is just fabulous. And when you, you hear her voice, you just want to, like, reach out and give her a big hug because she's just <laughs> so, like, amazing and wonderful. In fact, um, a, a couple of years ago in the Marine Corps, we do the transit, the tradition of the cutting of the birthday cake and the oldest and the youngest. And it was so funny because Helen ended up being the oldest Marine by like two months. And so we we're like, go Helen. <laughs> um, but so Helen served during World War II and Helen had a very unique uh, job. She actually worked on the fighter pilot planes and she would uh, put together the instrument panel for the planes that were going off to war in World War II. And so it was a very meticulous job and um, one that her and her fellow women Marines were tasked to do for the, um, you know, just to support and to do what they needed to do to support and to serve their country in World War II. Um, Helen has been just a, a, a motivating factor for um, just women veterans and women Marines in her story and um, ironically enough she served before um, the law was signed to allow women to serve permanently in the armed forces so um, when she talks about her experience you'll hear a little bit a little bit about that in her uh, in her clip scary <laughs> i really didn't want to leave but uh, unfortunately we were discharged at the convenience of the government. I hate that phrase, but uh, they no longer and uh, we had to leave. But coming back, uh, it was so different. Uh, I was almost afraid to go out. Uh, the traffic and uh, just people just doing crazy things. I did have to adjust to that, which I did. But uh, I certainly felt out of place. Well, that was Helen talking about her transition that, um, that she felt when she got out of the military. And it's not unlike um, what we feel today with regards to transition. Um, so um, definitely, uh, you know, Helen's first word is scary, and um, I don't know about uh, you, Lene, with the National Guard, but when I was coming from Okinawa, Japan, I had been there for a whole year, and, and prior to that, I was in uh, Camp Pendleton, California for three years, so I, I literally had only been home for maybe a handful of weeks at best, you know, like a week at Christmas, and I was able to get leave for Thanksgiving, and, and I popped in for a couple of days for my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. So, um, you know, Helen describing the first word when she was asked on how she felt when she got out was um, scary. And, and when I got out, 
which was, um, you know, in 1994, I'm dating myself, so don't do the math. <laughs> but um, uh, when I got out, it was hilarious because, hilarious in, in um, like an iconic way, because um, I had actually decided to re-enlist. And I had re-enlistment papers and I called all my family and said that I was going to re-enlist and I got my orders to Quantico, Virginia. I was very excited about. And then I had recalled a conversation I had with a, a master gunnery sergeant about, um, you know, he was retiring and what was he going to do? And he was talking about how he had to go to college and find his life. And, and so I got a little bit of cold feet and I decided to just um, get out, get out at the end of my four years. And um, it was funny because my transition, I didn't even think to have a coat. So I got out in January and I flew into Midway and I didn't have even thought of a coat, much less any kind of, you know, back then they just gave you like a stack of papers to transition out and, and here's your airplane ticket and that was it. And so I remember talking to my grandmother on the phone before I boarded in California and I said, Oh, I just realized I didn't have a coat. So here I am uh, discharged with my sea bag at Midway Airport. And, and my grandmother gave me this plaid coat that I think um, was from 1930 or 40 that barely fit me in the middle of winter. So uh, I can relate to uh, Helen saying that it's scary to get out because um, it really is. Your whole world is turned upside down from when you knew about uh, in the military to now what am I going to do? And I had gotten out on a whim. So I didn't have lodging. I had to sleep on my mother's couch. I, I barely had, you know, a couple dollars um, from vacation that I turned in, in my bank account. And I realized too, that all the colleges had, um, had already done all their admissions. <laughs> so I came out and I didn't even, I didn't have any, any paperwork in with any of the colleges. And and luckily, Northern Illinois University was able to accept me when I got denied by all the other universities because it was after their deadlines. So uh, that was, it, it really is a uh, profound experience to, to just come home. Um, Erica, I think, is a little younger than me, so she must, might have had a different experience uh, from, from It's a little more home. dramatic than what you just laid out. I did have a coat when I came home. <laughs> I <laughs> wasn't even thinking. I was, a war <laughs> you know, I was in California and Okinawa's warm weather. I, it just was not even a thought in my mind. I don't even think I owned a coat, to be quite honest. But, but there's something very emblematic about that, though, isn't there? That just, I think that there's just so little expectation and understanding of what to expect, right? So, while, it, while my transition, my personal transition, didn't have that kind of dramatic moment in it where it's like, oh, I can't believe I didn't think of this. I, what does resonate with me about what you and what Helen talk about is just how unknown the kind of world becomes when you leave a world of very strong bonds, a very clear purpose, a very um, obvious next steps where you're clear what's the next career step. And all of a sudden, you're just out in this, what feels like a huge world and you don't have a sense of, the roads and the networks and the way to kind of take the best first step. Um, and I, you know, I think that's probably a pretty common part of a lot of veterans experiences and that's hard to navigate in general, not knowing uh, those roads and those networks. And then you take away that kind of built in community and your tribe that comes with being in uniform and it, it can complicate it. I don't know, Lene, if you had your own thoughts to share on your personal experience out. Yeah, absolutely. So it's very similar to, you know, what um, Stephanie shared and what um, Helen have shared as far as the first word that comes to mind is fear. As most of us have shared, we were really young when we got in. And of course, you know, there's differences in length of service, but I think that the experiences are the same where you're young, you know, you're starting off in the world, you don't know you know, what to expect. And then you take on this big task of, hey, I want to serve my country. And then, you know, for me personally, during the time that I served, um, I did in, you know, um, enter into the Washington, Washington National Guard as a reservist. Um, but, you know, during that time, it was, everybody was deploying. Everybody, it was at, at the height of, um, you know, post 9-11. So um, I remember basically all of the battle buddies that I, you know, went through training with. It, we were getting orders while we were still in training. So that's an extremely, you know, 
scary experience because it's like, hey, oh my gosh, I just kind of, you know, joined this and hit the ground running. And then, you know, when I got out, um, it was the same, you know, I was stationed at Fort Lewis, as I mentioned. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I would say from my own experience, um, there wasn't a lot of the services or the transition services available that we see now. Um, I think during that time that highlighted the need for more intense transition services. So um, we didn't have the support. Um, you know, we weren't basically being briefed on all of our um, benefits that we were supposed to be receiving. And for me, actually, I didn't even utilize any of my experiences. Um, something I didn't men mention um, when I was getting out, I was a newlywed. Um, 19 years old, just got married, you know, that, you know, that's another <laughs> aspect. Starting a family, which is very common for a lot of, you know, veterans, specifically with women veterans, you know, you serve, you get out. Um, the first thought is not to go to school. It's, you know, I, you know, starting a family. Um, and then, you know, I went back to school in 2014. So that was around the time that I really started to look into, hey, I have these you know, benefits and having to navigate that by yourself is extremely, you know, overwhelming. Um, and I don't think that I really received a lot of that support until I moved to Chicago and, you know, in the veteran space of Chicago. Hmm. Well, let's talk for a moment then about, about the fact that there has been a bit of an evolution, thankfully, in how that transition happens. Not that it's perfect and not that there's, um, you're ever gonna eliminate the scariness of the experience, but there's been quite a bit of movement I think we can all speak to in terms of on the military side itself for those still in uniform, what that transition looks like, and then some better catch mechanisms on the veteran side. Um, so I wonder if, and I'll tee it to either one of you, um, you could speak a little bit to the kinds of programs that are out there to help catch veterans now, um, both on that uh, military side in uniform and on the veteran side. Well, I, I think that we, we uh, in the state of Illinois has a lot of services for veterans um, compared to some states. Um, we, I myself uh, was chaired the task force on uh, veteran suicide prevention, which is high on everybody's list in Washington and in the state. And we realized that, um, you know, specific services need to be helped. Like uh, Lene mentioned that she went to college um, as an older uh, attendee and I went to college after my service. So I was older and it's very frustrating going to college when you're surrounded by immature 18 and 19 year olds who don't have a clue about life. <laughs> And, um, and, and that causes a lot of stress. So here in Illinois, we've worked really hard with our college uh, network and our community college network. And there's uh, veteran assistance centers now on campus where veterans can go uh, connect with other, campus, uh, other veterans on campus and start um, putting together a little bit of that informal network that we used to have in the military of our buddies. And, and we can go and, and we can razz the other services and we can, um, uh, talk about things that 18 and 19 year olds in college really don't have any clue about when they don't have that life experience. And so what we find is um, making sure that individuals know uh, where services are. That was the genesis of Illinois Joining Forces. And uh, because you, you Google veteran services and there's thousands upon thousands of, of um, places and things and websites to go to. And um, definitely, um, you know, we got to make sure that we have assistance and that we have programs to help them. And um, that's just one example of the programs that we're working on in the college area. I, I know Lene has another example uh, that she works with, um, primarily uh, women veterans and, and housing. Um, we do have housing insecure veterans and um, we're working very hard uh, on the state of Illinois with regards to housing insecure individuals and homelessness, but uh, particularly we have to keep in mind our, our, our uh, homeless veterans as well, because like we said, when that transition is scary, like I was, um, by all definition, I was a couch surfer for many months and, and I didn't realize what I was doing was actually falls under the definition of homeless because I didn't have a home. I was sleeping on my mother's couch. I, I slept at my grandparents' house. I, I had to figure out where I was supposed to be uh, because I, you know, I wasn't married. I didn't have kids. I, uh, you know, I was all on my own. Um, 
the product of a divorced family. So you have mom here, dad there, you know, and, and you just don't know where to go. So um, housing insecurity is, is uh, something we're working with as well. And Lene, if you want to talk about the programs that you've been working with, with uh, women veterans to help them out. Absolutely. So one of the programs that I actually utilized myself and um, one that I've been able to um, connect women veterans with um, through our um, programs is the HUDVASH program, which is a collaborative program between um, the um, housing department um, and the VA. And so in that program, they provide vouchers, um, housing vouchers for veterans, and there's a priority um, to assist and eliminate this um, great need um, for homeless veterans. Um, another program, um, you actually slightly touched on it, Stephanie. Um, I was very active in the uh, Veteran Student um, Association. I, th for me, that was a lifesaver when I was going to college because, yeah, I was a non-traditional student. I needed to have peers that understood, you know, my background and my experiences, and it's you know, a, a support network that is, you know, absolutely necessary. And I know that many veterans within this space are relying on that network of um, peers. Um, also, the uh, USO Pathfinder program is a really good um, transition program that I know um, even IJF has been working with. Um, yeah, there, there's many, there's many um, awesome programs for, you know, transition. And Lenny, I wonder in, in your capacity as often helping to answer the, the kind of veteran needs as they come into the IJF Care Center, what is it that we see or hear um, from those veterans from an IJF perspective uh, on transition? What are the most common needs you hear today through the veterans that we serve? Well, highlighting the fact that the majority of the veterans that we are now serving or that we're seeing coming into the call center are post 9-11 veterans. So they're serving and much like my experiences, you know, they get out of the military, you know, the, the attitude of, you know, I don't need any, you know, benefits or I don't need that support. And it, you know, typically comes later on, um, you know, sometimes when it's an emergency, so that's actually um, a lot of our population that we're serving of veterans is the post 9-11. Um, so their needs vary. Of course, with um, male veterans, I would say, you know, housing, again, connecting them to HUD VASH, job placement, um, you know, helping them to understand their benefits um, with, you know, um, even with the VA. Um, so again, very similar to my experiences, but specifically with women veterans, um, I, I would feel like it, it is a very, of course, you know, with women veterans, we have a very unique experience. Um, so, you know, much like our counterparts, we are reluctant to receive services or even explore the options that we have until we're in, you know, emergency situations. So um, even the needs that we um, assist female veterans with are completely different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, maybe let's talk about that a bit more. It does feel like it'd be strange for the women of IJF to not talk about the unique needs of women veterans, right? right. But is there something uh, different about the women veterans transition experience or just generally? Um, I think you were hinting at a bit of it there, Lene, in terms of um, kind of coming forward to find those services and, and, and how we connect with women veterans and vice versa. Let's, let's talk about that for a second. Right, absolutely. So just like I mentioned, and I, I'm sure we can all agree, even being female veterans ourselves, our experiences are different um, than our male counterparts because we're not recognized in the same way. We don't acknowledge certain things. Um, for instance, um, even in my own personal experience, you know, when you're speaking up during service about issues um, that women veterans, I feel like our issues are tend to be related more towards personal um, experience, your, your life at home, um, and you're bringing that into your military service. So that brings such a unique pressure and, you know, a set of issues. Um, and that has been my encounter with the female veterans that we've been, uh, you know, assisting through our women veterans program. Um, the majority of women that we serve, um, we are seeing they're coming from either domestic violence relationships um, which is actually, you know, fairly common, unfortunately, 
Um, but again, it's very unique from the experiences of male veterans that are coming out of service. Um, mm -hmm. They're seeking services, um, relying more so on the peer support that we provide. So when I'm assisting a female veteran, that is at the forefront of, you know, how I serve, you know, female veterans. So there does seem to be something about um, women veterans helping women veterans, the, the peer support model, um, probably because there's something common about the women veteran experience. I certainly experienced it where you, you've been there, done that on being the only woman in the room, right? You've, you've lived in that culture, um, in a pretty tough culture in many ways in uniform. Um, and it can be hard to step into the veteran community that you kind of associate with that. So um, the more personal experiences, the connections between women veterans and serving women veterans uniquely, I think it can be pretty important. Um, Stephanie, anything to share on this front, either personally or from what you've seen with veterans you've been helping as well? Well, I think um, it, it is like, like Lene said, it's, it's um, difficult to be the only woman in the room and then much less to be the only female veteran in the room. It, it is um, very difficult with regards to that because um, even the traditional supports for veterans, like I am a, a member of the American Legion and I am a member of, of, of the traditional support organizations for veterans, but um, there are times when uh, I haven't felt comfortable being in the room with my fellow veterans um, with regards to, you know, some mannerisms. And, and there are some, some guys that have come up and said, you know, I never even really uh, agreed with women serving in the military. <laughs> you know, I mean, so you okay. have those, <laughs> those different personalities that, um, you know, you, so whereas the, the guys can go to some of these traditional groups and they can commiserate and they can uh, relate and they can share stories when you're the only female veteran in, in the group, there's not really, you can to a degree, but but you're very isolated. And, and women veterans overall find themselves very isolated, especially with, um, you know, situations such as Lene, who got out and was married and with kids. And um, you're, you're trying to work this, but your service has um, severed ties from, you know, high school friends or, or your support network because they went on to do things. And then when you came home, they weren't always there. So... Um, you, you lose support networks, and, um, and then if you are uh, a female veteran that did get married or that did have kids or unfortunately might have gotten divorced and have kids, now you're focusing on the immediacy of the situation, and, and that kind of goes along with women and self-care because you're focusing on, on getting the job done and you're working on kids, and so we find that women veterans start to struggle around four years past um, end of service. So about four years, they start to um, really, really start feeling isolated and um, really start feeling um, alone. And, um, and there is a, a significant um, possibility of, of suicide and, and, and depression around that four or five year mark. And that's why Erica, peer-to-peer -peer counseling is important throughout the whole veteran community to be around um, individuals that can support you and that can uplift you, but also because the women population of veterans is um, so spread out and um, is such a, you know, less than 10% of the overall uh, veteran population. Um, it's just very hard to connect. And so yeah. I mean, that's why I guess we can be thankful that now we are exploring these new mediums where, you know, I know Rose is on and she's a female veteran and you know, a lot of great people are on that, um, you know, that we can connect with now that uh, we might not have been able to connect with. So I'm looking yeah, that's forward right. to Digital does make it easier, huh? Yeah. In some way. So not I'm, every I'm, way. I'm really looking forward to um, reaching out and, and trying to really have uh, that connection with female veterans to try to do more within that realm. But it's just, um, it's, it's, it's difficult connecting. And, it, and there is an identity crisis with regards to gender because um, if you look at brain development, your brain is still developing up to age 23. And so a core of that development is in the military, which is a male dominated industry. And then you come out and so um, you, you're used to working in a male dominated industry and then you have individuals that want to gender stereotype you like you said, Erica, with uh, pink ruffles and um, 
and um, oh, I broke my nail, and you know, and 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 all these um, nuances that are stereotypically gender. And then when you have somebody that's, uh, you know, I was an E4 and and um, used to being having leadership skills, and and you speak up for yourself, and and you're not the wallflower, and 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 you're a little bit more direct. I mean, I've been accused of having a a brass personality, or a, you know, and and it's like. Well, no, I'm just being direct. And, and people sometimes just assume that that's just not um, the way that stereotypically gender female are supposed to act. So that yeah. makes it a little bit difficult as well. In some ways, the uh, women's experience over history and in many places, but maybe really <laughs> pronounced when it comes to, to women in, in uniform. I, I personally uh, feel like I often felt when I was in uniform that I was too feminine for the military, to kind of too soft-spoken, too much of a dance background, you name it. But then when I transitioned to the civilian world, uh, felt too military for the civilian world, right? That you kind of learn a culture and they have to bridge into it. And to your earlier point, that can be hard when we're so few and far between, right? Um, and I think some, you know, another aspect with military or women veterans, um, that few and far betweenness can affect too VA care, right? I mean, we hear these stories about uh, women who go into a VA facility, and I think this is getting better, but at being asked for your husband's SSN, right? Because the assumption is it's not you who served. And I know there's been some good movement on this front in, in VA care, but I wonder if either of you have some color to add on any unique women's healthcare issues, VA or otherwise, um, as part of an aspect of the, the women veterans experience. Yeah, I would actually like to chime into that just from my own personal experience and then also just from women veterans that I've encountered through IJF, um, the mental health um, services that uh, women receive. And I touched on it briefly as far as um, acknowledgement of, you know, the experiences or, you know, issues that um, women veterans face. Um, I assisted a female veteran um, maybe a few months back who was struggling um, with PTSD. And I remember her sharing her experiences where she was going to the VA. She was talking to a, you know, a counselor and you know, sharing her experiences. She was in for eight years and you know, deployed, I believe, two or three times. You know, the again, the the pressure of all of these things, and she's sharing her experiences, but they're not being acknowledged. And unfortunately, in her case, it wasn't acknowledged until it was too late. There was another issue that you know, came up because of the PTSD, the pressure of, you know, maintaining a family and having kids and you're struggling with service connected, um, you know, issues. So that has been, I think. I may have uh, frozen on Lene's screen there. Oh, yeah, Lene, Lene's internet froze. You froze a little bit there, Lene. <laughs> you couldn't get through a whole webinar without somebody freezing or <laughs> I think we got most of what you were sharing there. It was really, it was helpful and insightful. Um, Stephanie, anything to add on your end? Well, I'm on a, um, it's called the Illinois Governor's Challenge, and that's a nationwide initiative through the USDA to um, enlist states um, to provide services for our veterans. And one of the, one of the things we we're looking at is this disparity in VA uh, healthcare, and um, we're lucky because Heinz is really looking at um, alternative things that could help such as art therapy and uh, acupuncture and some of those alternative therapies that um, you know, women are more drawn to than some of those traditional just um, talk it out kind of programs. And so uh, just the, the quality of care that, um, that Heinz VA and, and our VA system is trying to embrace on, I think is important. I think um, also they are really expanding their levels of service uh, with regards to potential claims on how, uh, because uh, women are very capable to do a lot, but our, our DNA is different. And so the exposure to the burn pits overseas is affecting women a little differently than men. And looking at um, preemptively giving care to uh, pretty much veterans uh, that were stationed by the burn pits is, is something that's being worked at uh, on the federal level and something that we on the state level through a task force that um, I'm, we're forming, 
with because the DA just denies claims. And so, and, and women, because they're busy, they just don't have time to continually fight with the VA. I, I mean, nobody has time, really. I mean, I, I was on a call where an individual, his claim was pending for six years still. So um, just that bureaucracy adds a little bit more stress to the women veteran uh, because of, as Lene said, you have kids, you have a household, um, you're a non-traditional student, you're, you're trying to find your footing and you have no support network and you're the only woman veteran in a room and, and you have nobody to turn to and nobody to talk to. And then you, you might have undiagnosed uh, or unrecognized ailments that the VA is just not recognizing because it, the VA looks more, uh, there's a lot more male claims than female claims. And so then that they might not look at um, an abnormality in the way that they should. And, and, and so there's a lot of complex factors uh, that that do hit sometimes women veterans a little bit uh, more profound than than the male counterparts. Mm -hmm. Something else I wonder, um, and I want to make sure we leave time to um, open it up and see if anybody who's joined us has questions. But maybe before we do that, um, I wonder if we can talk for a moment on COVID because you can't get also through a virtual event without having the context of what's happening be pretty relevant. Um, I wonder how you all have experienced in, in, in terms of serving with serving veterans and, and community engagement. What are we seeing in terms of um, COVID impacts on veterans themselves? Anything particular or is it kind of the same as non-veteran impact when it comes to living uh, in this strange time? Um, I, I can jump on that. It, yeah. What we have found it's, it's a little different because when, when veterans have idle time and they're not getting the proper um, treatment that they should be getting, uh, especially our uh, war trauma veterans, uh, idle time brings back all the, the demons of the past. And so um, we have to be very diligent to reach out to those individuals to ensure that uh, they're doing okay because they have lost all the fillers of their time. So they've lost their coffee at McDonald's, they've lost their veterans breakfast, they lost their American Legion meeting, they've lost their VFW bingo hour, they've, they've lost all that, those fillers of time. And so we have to be diligent. I know our American Legions and veteran groups try to Zoom, but we only get like 10 or 15 people on Zoom because technology is a little frustrating when you get 60 to 70 veterans for a breakfast. Um, and so um, I think COVID is hitting the, uh, the veteran community a little bit harder than the, the rest of the community, um, especially our war trauma veterans. I also want to say, you know, 4th of July is right around the corner and that's very uh, tough on our war trauma veterans as well. Um, because while everybody likes fireworks, um, our, our war trauma veterans and, and veterans that served, um, you know, overseas and, and in conflict um, can bring about a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress and a lot of uh, flashbacks. And so uh, be cognizant of the veterans in your community this 4th of July as well. So um, it, it has been very hard, very hard to get that, that connectivity that veterans so need. And I know Lene has been um, really working hard at IJF with regards to COVID as well. Yeah. So Lene, what, what specifically um, at IJF is something similar to what Stephanie is seeing and, and doing in terms of that proactive outreach or beyond? Absolutely. So um, just, you know, to kind of touch on what Stephanie just shared, um, you know, one of the issues within the veteran um, population is isolation. Um, and I feel like that that has been accelerated through COVID. Um, you know, of course, individuals um, have been experiencing, experiencing it who aren't, you know, veterans or within this mm -hmm. space. And I think that it has been even intensified within the veteran population. Um, the other issue is the fact that since COVID, um, as we know, there has been um, additional barriers to services. Um, i.e. the, you know, the VA limiting services or, at, you know, being closed at a period of time, um, that creates additional challenges for the veteran population um, who are seeking services. Um, and I would say that it has absolutely affected us and even our work at IJF because um, that is the central point of our operations. 
Um, we have our care coordination center where our uh, care coordination specialists are reaching out to resource providers. And unfortunately during this time, um, either services have been suspended or temporarily um, reduced and there's a greater need now where we're being overwhelmed with, um, you know, um, a need for resources. So that has been one of the biggest challenges for us. The navigation becomes even more important in that moment when the one resource you knew, the, the office isn't open, right? And so Absolutely. having the network and helping to find something else uh, or call behind the scenes is extra important uh, given what you're describing. Yeah. I, I think um, I wouldn't want to leave entirely on the narrative that um, veterans only have struggles and challenges. We've talked about a lot of those. They are all true. Um, but I, there's also a DNA in veterans uh, that is about this kind of purpose and being part of something bigger. And Stephanie, I know you said you've seen amidst COVID some of that really play out um, mm -hmm. in terms of veterans finding they can step in and help and people are needing it amidst COVID. So can you spend a minute on that and, and really the flip side of if we can help veterans with these challenges, how they become fantastic resources in our communities? Oh, definitely. Um, well, there are many veterans that are isolated, but we have found that some of our younger veterans that uh, mostly are um, Iraqi and Afghan veterans are really now, um, instead of sitting at home and, and they have multiple uh, injuries, they are helping in the community. They are really finding their purpose in the food banks and really finding their purpose with delivering um, meals to shut-ins and um, distributing masks and, and really, uh, and food to the frontline workers. And so, uh, but the fear is that when now we're going into phase four, and um, when things, you know, what other purposes can we keep engaging in those veterans and, and we need to work at making sure that, that we still stay connected to them and their passion to serve because the, every, the, every veteran still has a passion to serve. Uh, the problem is, um, again, you know, just connecting them with resources and with outlets of, um, of of purposefulness and helpfulness that, that we need to provide for our veterans as well. Unfortunately, some of our older veterans, Helen and, and uh, World War II veterans and, and even some of our Vietnam veterans have um, been shut in because they're at high risk, because they've had heart attacks, because they've had um, health ailments. Um, and so uh, those are the ones we're trying to connect with Zoom, but our younger veterans who um, are on disability and, and were lost have been founding purpose. And, and we really hope that that purpose continues going forward. Yeah, it does seem to be that um, if you can connect, right? And it's a, it's a kind of impetus to connect what's happening amidst COVID for some of those veterans, as you mentioned. Um, we spoke about trying to highlight some resources. Uh, there's a couple of veterans organizations that are really about this right? Um, Team Red, White, and Blue is an organization that does a lot of connecting across veterans and non-veterans through kind of physical and social activity, just connection, right? Student Veterans of America, when I mentioned earlier, is creating those connections. Um, the mission continues, connection and purpose. There are all kinds of organizations out there, but I think they're all kind of working to connect and then channel that sense of purpose that, that um, we hear is happening amidst, amidst COVID too. So lots of resources. I, I did want to make sure that we can open it up. If there are folks who have been submitting questions, um, you can do that via the chat link. You can do that via the Facebook Live site. I think you might be able to do it by just turning your mute button off, but we would be happy to field any questions that, that you have. Yeah, thanks, Erica. And uh, thanks, ladies, um, first for your service to our great country. And thank you um, for your service to our veterans now, yourself. Um, we do have several questions, um, and so I'll just read them in the order they were submitted. I have uh, David Martinez, who's asked, what can we do to help improve healthcare delivery to veterans at the VA hospitals? Well, I can um, take that. I was just on a call, actually, with the USVA earlier this week, and um, you know, David, unfortunately, we're still struggling with rural areas. Here, uh, I'm located in the suburbs, close to Chicago, we have a lot of access to services, but in rural areas, um, we don't. 
Um, but we are always working now with the VA for telehealth options and um, really working with remote um, programs. So if you, if you want to uh, reach out to me personally about your experiences, if you're really struggling in, in having access to health care through the VA, we can, we can certainly help you out. But I know the VA, through the Mission Act that was si signed uh, last year in December, it's just getting online uh, with the VA now. And, um, you know, that's, it's really going to be working hard to provide more care. But it's, it's uh, government, the wheels sometimes do go a little bit slower than we want it to. And uh, definitely, we can um, certainly work with you directly if you want as well. Thanks, Stephanie. Linnea, if you had anything to offer, we could do that or pivot to the next question. I think that was a helpful start. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as far as access to care, I think um, one of the biggest things is there are so many um, community um, resource providers um, and organizations that are basically stepping up. Of course, I mentioned, you know, the great need with the mental health um, you know, crisis that is going on that, of course, was going on prior to COVID, but even intensified during this time. Um, there are a lot of organizations that are stepping up um, in order to partner with the VA, um, one being um, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. Um, they have peer support programs. They have um, mental health um, resources available um, through their programs and also um, peer support groups. So basically highlighting those organizations and also if you are you know, part of one of these um, resource providers within the community, um, stepping up and you know, exploring options for further collaboration. That's a great point. Sometimes it's advocacy, it's helping to kind of find the right resource in the VA, which is uh, where Stephanie started. And sometimes it's, there's a whole ecosystem out there that in the moment of crisis can kind of augment what's available. True. Any other questions in queue? Uh, yeah, we have a couple more. Um, the next question, um, from time to time we share programs we are doing in the Southland area and individuals ask about those south of us. Are there steps to provide more access to service or at least broadcast it in a way for those south of the Southland Will County can reach out to? I can take that actually from the perspective of IJF. <laughs> yeah, go for it, uh, that has actually been one of our biggest goals um, as far as within our VSC communities, um, identifying um, um, service providers and um, resource providers within the community and again partnering um, with those um, resources and linking of the veterans that we serve, the, the veterans that are calling in, um, because again, um, either they're, the services are scarce in that area or you know veterans are not aware of what's available to them. So that has been one of our biggest goals as far as within our VSC communities. And we do field calls from, in our care coordination center, I believe this to be the case, Lene, we do field calls from across the state. And there certainly is variation in terms of the amount of resources in, in um, different locales throughout the state. But um, I think the benefit of, of the kind of network and connectivity that we've been working to grow it, uh, at IJF is that we can help navigate too, right? So if, if there's a particular resource gap um, that is there, it, a call to the IJF Care Coordination Center might help navigate to something that, that folks weren't aware is out there. Um, that's always a, a, an extra step you can take. Uh, our, our phone number for that Care Coordination Center is 1-800-INFO-IJF. Um, that doesn't create more resources. It can just sometimes help um, navigate to the resource that might be. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Linnea. Great. Well, you get you ladies basically answered the next question, which was how can a female veteran and I'll add any veteran connect with IJF to access resources and services. Is there a toll free number they can call. Well, there you go. <laughs> there sure is. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of uh, that's the, the way the way to access us. Of course, we have a website as well at IllinoisJoiningForces.org. Um, but for that kind of high touch help me navigate to what I need, that 800 number, 1-800-INFO-IJF is a really great start point. Because even if 
the awesome veterans on the phone can't get you the immediate answer, uh, we, we navigate our way in the background to it if it's there, um, whether it's a veteran specific resource or whether it's just a community resource stepping up. And so it's a great start point to try and find the right resource. Great, and we have one more question from uh, Peter Baldo. And the question is for Lene. Uh, you mentioned the fear and adversity and being only 17 when you were enlisted, which is exemplary. What different leadership tactics did you develop and how are you using them in the workplace in the corporate environment? Oh, wow. That awesome is a question. <laughs> right. Thank you. That's an awesome question. Um, I think that all three or all, you know, all ladies can agree um, there is a development of leadership that um, happens within the military. Again, you know, um, having the unique experience of serving as a woman and, you know, basically um, a lot of times, unfortunately, facing certain issues by yourself um, and not necessarily having allies. So um, I would say that my development is, um, you know, has come from um, just this unique spirit that I feel like everybody who has served has is this resiliency um, and relying upon that. And then, you know, being in the veteran space on this side now, um, you know, serving veterans and, you know, forming these partnerships and finding additional bonds. Um, I think that that has been um, extremely helpful, um, even in my professional roles, um, because we still have that, um, you know, spirit, you know, of that's my battle buddy, you know, we're working together, um, we're continuing to uh, develop not only, you know, ourselves, but each other. So I would say personally, that's my experience. That was a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> it's such a good question. I want to ask Stephanie to answer it as well. <laughs> Could you speak a little bit to your own kind of what you learned individually and now apply as a, as a leader in government affairs and beyond? Well, I think um, one of the, one of the differences is that um, like we don't ask for permission to get things done. We're just here to get things done. And there's been a lot of uh, civilian women that are like, oh, I don't know if I should do that. I should, and, and I'm like, let's just do it. So uh, we have this this mission driven mentality, which is unique from uh, many other individuals in the in the civilian world, where we we see a problem, and we're just going to go and fix it, and we're just going to go and get it done. And um, honestly, I uh, formed a partnership with Casa Illinois, which is a court appointed special advocate because they specifically want veterans to, to sign up to be court appointed special advocates because they are mission driven. Like they are there for the child and they will not give up for those kids. So, and, and women veterans are the, are the same way. Um, we're just mission, mission driven. And so uh, leadership is, is what you do on the front lines, but it's also what you do in the back lines. And I think one of the, the leadership tactics that I, um, that, you know, a part of my leadership is know yourself and seek self-improvement. You know, that's one of our, our um, leadership uh, points. And, and that's always stuck with me. So I've always tried to know myself and I've always tried to seek self-improvement either through education or learning or opening my mind to hear other people's point of view. Um, and I think that's, I mean, we have leadership principles and leadership traits in the Marine Corps and those are drilled into you. And, um, you know, and, you know, you need to respect your troops and you need to, res you know, and, and there's just so much, you know, integrity and, and our, um, our leadership and Erica, I'm, I'm sure the army has that too. Your leadership traits and principles are your foundation and your rock. And, um, and I'm unnerving on them, you know, and, and sometimes I'm honest to the detriment, you know, and, but um, I'm not going to compromise my leadership principles and traits. Uh, yeah. or anything and so a lot that takes a lot of people a little bit off guard oh I love that though I think um there's there's so much actually in what you both have said and I'll just you know speak from my own experience as well I I think um for sure the sense of purpose and the I guess I'd summarize some of what you were saying um as urgency to action right you're just gonna move I might not know the whole answer but I'm gonna take the first step I've got good planning ability, the, the military taught me that, and you're just going to move and try and get something done. And I see that urgency to action in a lot of veterans, not just the purpose, but then you pair it with that, that urgency. And I think it can kind of make big things happen 
outside of the military ranks as well. Um, the other thing I feel like I gained from my uh, military experience that I apply every day now um, in the energy sector is you, you step into stuff you've never done before when you're when you're in uniform and you're in the case of, of officers and, and others um, leading people who have more technical expertise than you and a longer time in service and you just step into something that you know how to lead you know how to learn but you're not the expert and so constantly leading while learning and growing and being able to be uncomfortable with and, and act amidst that being uncomfortable that's part of the stretch of the military experience that I find is a valuable kind of muscle that I that I built in my military days and that I use even now so much stuff that folks uh, learn in uniform that I think then gets applied in community service and in, in companies you name it and I was enlisted so we were used to the Young, uh, <laughs> the officers coming young in, officers no idea. Coming in and, and you having to work with that. Me? <laughs> go, we'd have to walk outside the room and shake our head and go, oh, uh. yeah, and then we'd have to no, go back no. in the room and, and, and work with the officers. So definitely working uh, with, with that echelon of enlisted and officer um, and, um, and, and even the warrant officer, which is the blend of enlisted and officer, uh, really teaches you how to work with everybody in the military. Yeah, you can't lead without listening, right? That's the best of them right. do that. So, <laughs> what other questions are out there? Yeah, we have a couple more. Um, uh, Charles Frangos, I hope I'm saying that right, Charles. Um, I enlisted after high school in Naperville and returned to Illinois to take advantage of the Illinois Veterans Grant. How can the state demonstrate that transitioning veterans have opportunities to continue and opportunities to continue to attract? returning veterans? Well, thank you for uh, leaving and coming back to Illinois. That's what I did. Um, we are actually uh, working with our congressional counterparts with regard to the Transition, Transition Improvement Act. Uh, Senator Debbie Staber now um, passed that. And, and what we're able to do now that we weren't able to do before is to have veterans, uh, active duty service members sign up up to a year in advance to get information from their state and information from the state and what is what is here for them, such as job training opportunities, the Illinois Veterans Grant that we have, uh, other um, opportunities for returning veterans. So that was not in existence. Um, I mean, I think when I was in, Erica, you might've started this with IDVA, but when when I got out, I didn't even get a letter from Illinois saying, we're happy you're here. <laughs> you know, I mean, so uh, so I know that I think that Illinois uh, Department of the Veterans Affairs sends like a welcome letter for those coming back. But to the point of your question, um, it, it we do have to work with the Department of Defense. And before then, getting access to information was very limited up to, uh, we just knew who was coming like when they got discharged. So with this new bill in the Senate that's passed, uh, people can transition up to a year out of their active service, uh, end of service time, and that the veteran can opt into, or the service member, I'm sorry, the service member can opt into uh, sharing information with the state that they're going home to so that we can actually send information and, to the service member before they come back to their states. And that was you pointed it out that that is a gap in transition because what we found is uh, service members transition in a state that's not their home state. I transit, I had my, um, it's like a week long now when I, I had like a one day thing, but it was in California and it was just a high level. And so now uh, through this new uh, new change and new advancement, working with our congressional countertop counterparts, we're going to be able to uh, definitely get more information in the hands of veterans to come back to Illinois. So, That's huge. And, and I represent Naperville so in my district, so I'd love to connect, and, um, and uh, I, I really do appreciate meeting uh, fellow veterans in the community. That's going to be really huge to be able to, I mean, it was something we were trying to work on years ago when I was uh, with the State Department of Veterans Affairs. So how do you catch um, because you've heard this repeat theme throughout, the resources are often there. How do you connect veterans to them? The Illinois Veterans Grant is a fantastic program, I, I, unmatched in, in terms of um, its benefit and how many people can actually take advantage of that at a state level. But how you catch the veteran on the way in, how you know they're coming, that's always been the trick. And so 
um, it's nice to see that there is some progress happening on that on the on the policy front, which can work to do better in that catch. And and that's the main thing was I realized that, uh, you know, the American legions and the VFW um, seem very stogy and, uh, you know, not as trendy as Team Red, White, and Blue and the CrossFit gym. But keep in mind that these profound changes in policy comes from the advocacy of the American legions and the VFW. Uh, I understand, you know, I mean, there are great things that other organizations do, but the main veteran advocacy that we need because there is such a low number of veterans serving. Like I said, there's 177 members in the General Assembly. There are four in the Illinois House and there are three in the Illinois Senate. So there are roughly seven veterans out of 177 that are trying to advocate for you. And we need the help of the American Legion and the VFW to help advocate our other members uh, to educate them on what is going on in the veteran community. So I would encourage everybody not to shun the American legions and the VFWs because they are a huge advocacy for these kind of policy changes in, in uh, Washington and policy changes on the Illinois state level as well. I think that's a really important point. There, there's no, you can't match the voice of how they are able to speak for the veteran community um, by virtue of the membership that they have and also the navigation um, on some of those stickier benefits things and helping veterans get that VA access with their disability claims. Uh, it, it takes all parts of the veteran support ecosystem and you were pointing out some really important roles that those organizations play. And I, I mean, think they're coming past their yeah. stodginess. I think, you know, at post by post, <laughs> lots of young veterans joining. And so they are, they are joining. I'm just saying, uh, yeah. I have heard that they're, you know, just not as much fun as Team Red, White, and Blue and, and some of the other uh, and, and I admit there's, there's other focuses on some of the other groups that are, are worthwhile as well. Um, but I mean, the American Legions and the VFW would not give up on the Blue Water, um, Blue Water Act, which, you know, is connecting uh, service members from Vietnam to Agent Orange that were out on the water. Uh, the VA would not recognize that. They were only recognizing um, VA claims with regards to those that were in theater. And and 60 some years later, now our Blue Water veterans can claim, make claim to benefits. So um, advocacy, we're at an all time low of veterans serving in office. And, and, and so um, we need those advocacy groups too in the American Legion and the VFW. Mm -hmm. What other questions are out there? Yeah, great. Um, what role can can and do civilians play in assisting veterans in their community? There's a lot of ways you could go with that one. Who wants to have? The, who wants to go first? I answered the last one. I'll let Lene start. All right, Lene, you're on. <laughs> Thank you. Well, actually, I was going to just highlight that that's actually one of our focuses at IJF is connecting with. Um, you know, community resources that are not necessarily veteran centric. So um, there are a lot of um, community members um, who are non-veteran who are willing to step up um, and basically support, um, you know, the efforts um, with us, you know, specifically in our interactions with, again, the VSC communities. Um, we have a lot of non-veteran centric resources that we are able to provide. Well, and I think um, civilians should really familiarize themselves with uh, the veteran community. I mean, granted, uh, the veteran community is a small segment of the population as a whole. And I, I recognize that, um, you know, when you wear a, a, a ball cap that says veteran, people say thank you for your service. But always, uh, you know, civilians need to be engaged in the aspect as well when they're cutting benefits to veterans, when veterans aren't getting the funding they needed for services, um, you know, citizen advocacy for, um, you know, jobs and, and for, you know, when Helen was talking about when she came home, you know, her job was waiting for her. But um, I, I find it a little bit off-putting that the uh, U.S., um, USA, America has to give credits for businesses to hire veterans. I find that put off putting because um, civilians and business owners should seek out high level veterans and, um, you know, realize what a, um, you know, really dedicated worker they are and not 
um, just for the sake of getting the tax credits, open up a call center, you know, in their basement for veterans and say we're hire veterans, which is not um, attuning to the skill set as well. So I think being really educated, um, recognizing that Memorial Day is not about the sale at Macy's, that uh, Memorial Day is about the men and women that gave their life for our country and that we should honor that. And, um, you know, be involved. Um, there are groups of auxiliary, there's Sons of the American Legion, people who have a grandfather or father that served can join the Sons of the American Legion or uh, the auxiliary of the American Legions. And there's, there's many avenues for advocacy. It's more than just thank you for your service. That's um, passive. We need active citizens involved in uh, really coming together and uh, completing that support network, like Lene said, and really being involved in what is a veteran? Like, what yeah. is the what is a veteran? And 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 you know, how can we actively support veterans? Is is the question that I'd like to hear a lot of civilians saying. I think that's such a great challenge to kind of use your voice as an advocate, right? And to not just say thank you for your service. I I think another way. Um, is to the what is a veteran question. I think sometimes people don't understand it because we, we stop at thank you for your service, right? I, I think that there's such respect at times for veterans these days and such a desire to express that and an awareness of PTSD and, the, and a much different experience that often, it was often my experience that somebody would say, thank you for your service and then just actually not know what to say next. Like you didn't want to hit a tripwire or something. And so one of the very simplest things I feel like non-veterans can do is actually seek to understand and be community to veterans and to in this case ask the next question so what was that like because the veteran themselves will decide how much they want to answer that question but this freeze up of just i'm going to thank you for your service and move on because i'm not sure what else to do actually can can increase the sense of isolation that that veterans have of oh nobody will ever get this experience so yes advocate but also know, to learn, try and learn the experience and the stories of veterans in their lives. And, and then I, I guess I'd say this, the third thing I think of when I think, well, what can you do as a non-veteran? Know just one entry point, right? And encourage uh, the veteran that you cross paths with or the veteran that's in your life to, to find and seek the resource that they need when they're struggling. That might be IJF as a good first entry point. It might be something else, but knowing a resource or two um, to be able to help when you are causing paths with a veteran, I think is a third way you can help as a civilian. Any other questions out there? I know we're coming up close on time, but there, there are good questions coming our way. Well, we do have one more question, but I, um, so if we could fit two more, two more in, because I wanted to tee up a little bit from that last question. Um, what role do civilians play? And do you guys want to mention real quickly what you're doing at IJF with the wellness checks um, and how that's been going and how that's working? Renee, do you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually have um, started a campaign where um, our care coordination specialists are reaching out either to previous clients or um, if you're calling into the call center now, if you're a veteran, a family member, um, anybody within the community, um, if you are, you know, in that space, you can request to have a wellness check um, for a veteran that you know. Um, and as I mentioned previously, this is a very important aspect, um, especially now with everything going on with COVID-19 because of the fact that, you know, the issues of isolation and um, other mental health challenges that are going on within the veteran space. So. Um, that's actually, you know, one of the biggest things that we are doing now at IJF and um, our focus um, has been just to basically make sure that we're checking in on our, you know, fellow veterans and um, providing that peer support. Um, of course, both of our call center um, specialists are veterans themselves. Of course, you know, the majority of our team are veterans. And so um, we are able to provide that, you know, um, support um, within our, you know, sharing our unique experiences and, um, you know, again, providing their support. Mm -hmm. We're doing organizationally what we hope civilians in general will do, right? Reach out, do that wellness check. Yeah. yeah. What was the other question that's still out there that would maybe we'll, we'll end our time together today on? Sure, we have one more question from Carolina. Uh, will other veterans be able to access the resource guides that you just mentioned for those who are just getting out? 
I'm trying to tie it to what resource guides we might have mentioned in the course of this conversation. Is it ringing a bell for both of you, or is it we can always get you the resource if you call on Jay up, which is right. always a safe answer? <laughs> I'm not sure of a resource guide that we mentioned. Uh, it sounds, state, the state has, has several resource guides that we can send out, and, and we also can send out DOD. So um, we can look at that from the um, state level and um, get them information on, on who's available and what, um, what resources they need. Um, definitely, uh, we are working with all sorts of organizations. So if there is an organization that needs more resources than a resource guide, then um, uh, we can certainly work we can certainly work with anybody. Yep. And we can follow up offline afterward as well with mm -hmm. those who are interested. Just let us know that you are. Yeah, I, I see that's Carolina in the chat. And so Carolina can get us the, mm -hmm. her information or if it's a group that she's, she's referring to, um, definitely. And also uh, I would be remiss if we didn't mention our um, veteran service officers and our uh, veterans assistance centers on the county level. I was just on a VA call where the Peoria uh, County Veterans Assistance Center got a big shout out from a couple veterans there. So definitely contact your county uh, Veterans uh, Assistance Center. They can have a lot of resources as well. Great. Well, I wanna thank um, both of you, a fellow veterans representative, Lene, for, for being here today, for sharing your own experience and the expertise you have from serving veterans as well as you do. Um, and thanks to everybody who has joined us. You had, you had great questions, and hopefully you've um, walked away with some nugget you didn't have before. We're here and around as resources, as an organization and individually, um, if there's something that you didn't have the chance to ask. Um, but I am encouraged uh, by the interest of, of our community in general and serving those who have served. It's an awesome community, one I'm really part, uh, proud to be a part of um, and, and wanna keep serving with all of you who have taken the time to be part of this conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. You have a Thank good rest. Thank you, day. everybody. Thank you.